Privacy Abbreviated, brought to you by BBB National Programs. As our regular listeners know, our goal is always to help business leaders prepare and operationalize for what's next in the privacy space. I am Donna Frazier, Senior Vice President of Privacy Initiatives at BBB National Programs. Um, today's podcast is a special edition, a timely special edition with a special guest who I will introduce shortly. Many of our listeners may be aware of the ongoing negotiations between the United States and EU regarding the EU-US Privacy Shield, or what is now called the EU-US Data Privacy Framework, affectionately referred to as DPF. You'll hear us refer to it as DPF throughout today's podcast. In summary, really less than two weeks ago on July 10th, the European Commission deemed DPF adequate. And we'll talk briefly about what adequacy means, um, but essentially providing assurances for U.S. businesses that can once again do business with the EU in compliance with GDPR. So today I have the great pleasure of welcoming a special guest, Coben Zweifel Keegan, who is currently the Managing Director of IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals. And prior to joining IAPP, Coben was with us at BBB National Programs. He had an integral role helping to oversee our organization's former EU-US Privacy Shield program. He was there from the transition from Safe Harbor to Privacy Shield. So he has a lot of insights to give. And I thought the best person to be here today to talk to us about this. So, Coben, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Donna. It's really good to, to be back on BBB National Programs turf and, <laughs> and, and talking with you. And this is, as you know, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. So I'm excited to chat with you more about it. Yeah, no, you've invested a lot of a lot of time and energy and hours in, into all of this um, and been watching it closely. So before we get started, for listeners who are interested in learning more about the timeline between what was Privacy Shield being deemed inadequate and where we are today, please visit the DPF timeline on our website. You'll find a link to that in in our resource section. So, Coben, let's kind of jump into this. I don't want to assume that all of our listeners know everything about this, right? There may be some listeners who are new to business, who don't understand what this all means, and particularly what it means for small to medium-sized businesses to be able to operate what does adequacy mean? What doesn't it mean? How do we get here? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Adequacy is sort of a weird word. It doesn't sound sound that exciting. It doesn't sound necessarily like something you would want to strive for, uh, just to be adequate. But that's the the word that the European uh, Union uses under GDPR as one of the types of valid transfer mechanisms that would allow for the export of personal information from the EU to other countries. And so basically stepping back a step, the GDPR has within it, I don't know if we've defined the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is the comprehensive data protection law uh, across the European Union, has within it a restriction on transferring data that that falls within the scope of the law outside of the, the countries within the European Union. Within the GDPR, there's a number of ways that you can legally export data from the EU. One of the the kind of the easiest, the gold standard is an adequacy decision. What happens in that is the European Commission reviews the practices of the receiving country and decides the practices, the laws, the legal standards of of the receiving country and decides that they are up to snuff, that they're essentially equivalent to the standards in the EU. And they provide basically a stamp that allows for any company operating within that receiving jurisdiction to legally receive data. So the U.S. has always had a kind of special type of adequacy arrangement when it does have adequacy arrangements with the EU, which is what you just introduced, this safe harbor, then privacy shield, and now the data privacy framework, the DPF. Those are conditional adequacy agreements. They are. It's not for every single con- company that operates within the United States, it only covers those companies that do something, do an extra step to commit to additional a digital set of principles negotiated between the U.S. and the EU and administered through this data privacy framework program at the Department of Commerce. In the absence of adequacy arrangement, which is what we've been in for the past couple of years since Privacy Shield was invalidated. There's a number of other legal mechanisms that you can use. Standard contractual clauses, 
which are basically contracts between an exporting organization in the EU and an importing organization in the US, or binding corporate rules, which are complex inter-organizational mechanisms that big companies are able to, to get um, after a long process with the EU. And there's a couple of other legal mechanisms. However, part of what we learned in the Privacy Shield decision in Schrems 2 was that there were questions about all types of transfer mechanisms, such that during this period of time, there hasn't been any mechanism that it was not subject to some scrutiny and possibly not actually compliant with the, with the GDPR. But what we've seen, what happened recently was that the U.S. took steps in negotiation with the EU to put additional safeguards on top of how its intelligence community operates and installed additional imbalances and redress mechanisms for people located in the European Union. And that has not only allowed the DPF to return, but also um, made it so that those other mechanisms are stronger as well, because it changes the calculus that European countries have to make when they say, should I be allowed to, to send this data to this other country? So I think all the things that you've highlighted obviously make sense as to, as to how we got here. How important is it for companies, especially, again, I keep saying this, the small and medium-sized companies, but if they're not using any of these mechanisms, what are the risks? I mean, what, what are the consequences, right? So let's just say they, they should be, let's encourage them to use DPF, data privacy framework. But what if they're not using it? What are the consequences? What do we think the consequences are to that? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's an important one. I think a big reason that so many people paid close attention to the enactment of GDPR back in the day was just how rigorous the fining authorities, the, the enforcement penalties are for violations of the data protection law. The failure to establish a legal mechanisms for transfers is a substantive violation of the GDPR. And so all of the uh, data protection authorities, which are the regulators in every EU country, they're able to investigate and enforce those violations. So certainly for exporting at a company in the EU that's exporting that data, it could be immediately subject to penalties for that, for doing it incorrectly. But on the U.S. side, the GDPR has extraterritorial effect, which essentially means that even U.S. organizations, if they're receiving data without adequately documenting and properly following the compliance obligations, they could be subject to fines and other types of penalties. But the fines are what usually grab people's attention. The GDPR allows for up to 4% of global turnover as a fine in the worst case scenarios, which is a massive hit for basically any type of company of any size because it is scaled to the size of the company. And so during this time, I guess kind of what's important to think about uh, is that like before, until the last week, everyone has been in somewhat the same position and the regulators have understood that like there's no 100% compliant way to transfer personal information because of the ongoing negotiations between the US and the EU governments. But now that all of the pieces are in place, companies that aren't taking the extra steps to make sure that they are in compliance are falling behind. They're, they will be subject to regulatory scrutiny. And that's definitely a, a factor that people need to consider if you have any EU personal information in your systems, either from other companies or directly from EU consumers. Great. So as I mentioned in your introduction, you were extremely integral in helping BBB national programs stand up and continue to operate our IRM, our independent recourse mechanism program. There's a lot of conversation about self-certification, not a lot of conversations about IRMs. I would appreciate you providing some insight into how IRMs really help companies with this, right? Self-certification is one thing, but what are IRMs providing companies that they don't get through just mere self-certification? Yeah, thanks. That's a very Love to talk about that. <laughs> As you know, IRMs are independent recourse mechanisms. And part of the cool thing about how Privacy Shield was structured and how the data privacy framework is also structured is that it has a multi layered accountability model for it's voluntary but enforceable. And part of that is through this multi layered model. 
when a company applies to the Department of Commerce, there's a, there's a subpart of the Department of Commerce called the International Trade Administration, and they administer this program. They just launched their website this week, so you'll have to go a little easy on them. But yes, <laughs> but they are uh, they are there to make sure that both current participants from Privacy Shield and the new participants coming in are doing all of the steps that are required. And what an IRM is is the place that will handle consumer disputes. That will handle uh, complaints from data subjects in the European Union that have an issue with the company's participation in the data privacy framework. So if they think that the company had a substantive violation of the framework, or if they think that if the company wasn't responsive to their complaints or didn't delete data when it was supposed to or things like that, they can submit that complaint to their IRM. There are quite a few IRMs that are established in the United States they have to be approved by the U.S. government. And that's kind of where that's multi-layered accountability mechanism comes into play. You have to be able to establish that you have certain confidentiality and and independence requirements in order to be an IRM. And you have to show that there's kind of the rigor behind the program that's necessary. Some of them are operated by for-profit organizations and some like BBB National Programs operated by non-profit organizations. With regards to the IRMs and particularly our IRM, we are very hands-on. I think one of the benefits for sure is this is not just a one-off conversation, right? We're there to have ongoing conversations with companies and answer any questions as they may change their business practices. Because oftentimes we know that we're not always dealing with lawyers. A lot of these small businesses don't have lawyers. We are certainly not their lawyers. We're not acting as their lawyers, but they don't have anyone to really ask questions of. Oftentimes, They're not legal counsel. They can't afford outside counsel. We may be talking to product managers, marketing people, whatever it is. But I think we are in tune with, I think, how to have the conversations no matter where you sit in your organization, big or small. Yeah, and I think that adds value, especially for the small and medium enterprises that are trying to to navigate the process for sure. One thing that people often get wrong, I think, is to post their privacy policy before, like in advance, uh, kind of doing it before they're approved by the Department of Commerce. But it's incredibly important to read the emails very closely whenever you're interacting with the Department of Commerce and follow their instructions closely, including not updating privacy policies until instructed to do so. It sounds like there's a bit of an exception to that right now for existing participants. Correct. But we are, yeah, I'm waiting to hear, I think, more from the Department of Commerce to make Mm -hmm. it a little bit clearer what the process is. But my understanding for people that are already in is that part of that benefit staying in all this time is that you'll transition over to the data privacy framework, which does mean having to update your privacy policy to say all the same things that you said for Privacy Shield, but instead for the data privacy framework. And that process will, at the very minimum, involve logging in to the new website. I do believe that everyone's logins have transferred to the new website yes. and that the process will take place in there. But the guidance from the Department of Commerce mentions that you can go ahead and update those commitments and immediately rely on the framework for those transfers as long as you have everything in place, just like you would have done for Privacy Shield. But for anyone that wasn't already in and was or, or lapsed and withdrew from the program, you'll have to begin the self-certification process fresh and and go to the Department of Commerce to start that process. Right. And I think it's important to note that over the years, with regards to companies making disclosures that they were participating in formerly the Privacy Shield, and it may have gone so it may have gone as far back as Safe Harbor when it was Safe Harbor, but the FTC has brought cases against companies for falsely s- stating that they were actually in Privacy Shield. So I think it's important to note that there are consequences to making these false claims in your privacy policies. It falls under Section 5 of of the FTC Act, right? This is a false claim. You're making assurances to your consumers, to your users. So I think companies need to be really aware of that and be very careful about the disclosures that they're making. The reason that this all, the system all works is because the FTC is able to enforce what you put in your privacy policy, which generally should not be deceptive and shouldn't make false claims, including if you say that you rely on the uh, on the privacy shield and you have not self-certified through the program, that is definitely going to put you in hot water with the FTC. And they also have brought a couple of substantive privacy shield claims as well. 
and they'll continue to do that monitoring to the DPF, both because they want to and because they're required to under the agreement with the EU. Mm -hmm. So you and I have talked offline about this, the conversation about belts and suspenders, right? The, The use of DPF for companies along with something else. And what is that something else? And you mentioned earlier SECs, um, standard contract clauses, or BCRs, binding corporate rules. I think BCRs, I think we would agree, BCRs are not appropriate for small and medium-sized companies who aren't engaging with a lot of highly sensitive, masses of highly sensitive data, right? I think there are maybe fewer than 200 companies in the U.S. who are actually using BCRs. And those, I think, would probably be the large pharmaceutical companies, large financial companies who have a lot of highly sensitive data that small to medium-sized companies should really be thinking about. What does belts and suspenders mean? What does that mean for small to medium-sized companies? Yeah, so I think part of the answer there has to do with where we are now. I think it has been a couple of years since we've had a framework in place. And a lot of people during that time tried to do everything that they could to be as close to compliance and alignment with the EU's requirements as as possible. And so one of those things that they could do was to uh, sign the standard contractual clause agreements with any entities that they were doing business with in Europe. Those are still valid. They're actually a little bit stronger now because of the surveillance adjustments that the U.S. has made, the additional commitments from the intelligence community. But I think a lot of companies realize that there are additional, that that doesn't necessarily cover all of the data that they would be, the personal information that they collect from European data subjects. Yeah, a lot of companies end up with both. We certainly saw that during the uh, Privacy Shield era. There were a lot of companies that had both SECs and Privacy Shield self-certification, and that's kind of the, the belt and suspenders approach there. But it's just good to keep in mind those gaps, the kind of specific gaps that are in place between what is covered by SECs and what's covered uh, by a broader framework. And all of that, usually, I guess the best way to do that is to start with kind of the, the usual data map exercise and thinking like, where is my where is my data coming from? Which of these data flows involves information from Europe? And making sure that every one of those is, is covered by some sort of mechanism. Right. So you mentioned this two plus year period in which companies were trying to figure out while Privacy Shield was invalidated, what else they could do. I think there may be some fatigue in the marketplace in regards to whether or not companies want to get back into this and what their faith is in this new framework, right? So let's talk about the elf in the room, which is a looming challenge to DPF. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on what you think about a challenge And I'm of the mindset that I think we just need to give this an opportunity to actually work. Let's let's see what this looks like in real life. We see it on paper. Let's see it in practice. But would love to hear your thoughts on that, the prospect of a challenge, the timeline of that. And should companies just say, you know what, this is something that's important. We're just going to do this and see what happens. Yes. So Mark Schrems, uh, the advocate in the EU whose organization, NOIB, None of Your Business, has brought the prior Schrems 1 and Schrems 2 cases to the European Court of Justice, has made it clear that he intends to challenge the European Commission's adequacy decision just like he's done before. There are a lot of things that are different this time around, but Mox certainly, it only makes us better when we have people out there challenging it at the margins. I think what you would hear from the governments involved this time is that they they believe in the in the effort that they put into this. Part of what took a number of took years instead of months was that they had to work out the all of the details of this framework to make it so that it could survive a legal challenge and that would meet the requirements that the European Court of Justice set out in the last decision. There were concerns around kind of the proportionality and necessity of U.S. government surveillance practices and the redress options available to European data subjects. Both of those major concerns have been addressed. Some people will continue to question whether a legislative action would be required, and that's probably an argument that Mox will make. But part of last time it took a number of years also to bring that challenge to fruition, so it'll be a number of years before we figure that out. And for now, we do have this legal mechanism, and it it carries the force of law on both sides of the Atlantic. For companies, it, it it always sort of was a shame that there wasn't really much a company could do either way in this situation, right? Mox's concerns 
well, Mox has a variety of concerns. One of the concerns that ended up being reflected in the European Court of Justice decision were about U.S. government access to information and not so much about the specific commercial practices of the companies he's been challenging. So that's what has been fixed. And a lot of the and the commercial provisions were, uh, haven't been updated very much. So companies weren't able to, to change anything about, about that. And the entire framework went down because of those surveillance concerns, uh, even though the commercial provisions were not what the European Court of Justice was concerned about. So those are back. Everything Everything's back and operational. And for now, it does have the force of law. So I think most companies will take that for what it is and, and know that it's not the most difficult thing to apply for and get. It just requires these additional commitments, which are generally tracking privacy best practices anyway, and largely track with state law requirements in the U.S. nowadays, now that we have 12 state laws. It's maybe just a a useful foundational step to getting your state practices in shape. So, Which I think um, is why a lot of companies stayed in Privacy Shield, right? It It was a way for them to demonstrate their ongoing compliance to something and hold themselves accountable to something. So I don't think that that has changed significantly. You know, companies need to be held accountable to something. Yeah. And it was, I mean, at the time, now we've seen this massive set of state laws come through, Mm -hmm. but at the time of Privacy Shield, this really was some of the strongest commitments companies could make that would be enforceable through a standardized framework. So that carried a lot of of weight and and it sort of meant something it was meant anyway to mean something to customers as well Mm -hmm. both sides of the atlantic so yeah we'll see now it's back so people will see how people do and pushing for more adoption of it but it will continue now we have this legal framework in place which will be a really good means for companies of all sizes to not have to worry about doing something that's completely against the law. Right. So we've been talking about this as EU-US and under Privacy Shield, there was an EU-US Privacy Shield and then there was also the Swiss-US. In the time that this has been invalidated, the UK is no longer part of the EU. So under Data Privacy Framework, there is a separate framework for UK and US. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, definitely, because it complicates things a little bit more than they were before it's just it's sort of because especially because switzerland and the uk are have different approaches to how they're tacking on to the eu's negotiated instrument here so yeah under privacy shield there was the eu us framework and the swiss us framework they were largely identical with some differences in them um but entirely separate frameworks you could if you're a company that only does business in switzerland or only receive Swiss personal information, you could just self-certify to the Swiss Privacy Shield framework, and that remains true for the data privacy framework. The UK is different, and it used to be not different, as we know. That was it was just was pre-Brexit. Uh, it was just part of the EU. Now it has its own separate country again, and it's no longer subject to the laws of the EU. It still has its version of the GDPR, which has remained largely unchanged, except for some updates. They are expected to update it some more, but they will continue to recognize these types of frameworks. So the way that 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 ended up playing out here is there's a UK extension to the EU US DPF, and companies can self-certify to that EU extension. Even existing DPF companies need to make the affirmative step of applying for that UK US extension because it is its own thing. But it's not its own thing in the sense that you have to be in the EU US DPF if you want to be in the UK extension, which is why they've very carefully called it an extension, I think. Um, it You have to continue to participate in the EU US DPF and then you add on the UK US extension. That is not yet valid yet either. We're still waiting for UK's approval of what they would call a UK US data bridge, which is essentially the same thing as adequacy. They're just calling it something cuter now. When they put in place that data bridge, that will recognize the adequacy and the validity of self certifications to the UK extension. And and following all the same rules under the EU-US DPF. So both organizations that are currently self-certified and those that are not will need to 
make that affirmative step of applying with the Department of Commerce to get the UK recognition. And I think that's an important factor because there, I, I, because of the close relationship between the US and UK commercially, a lot of companies were relying on the EU US privacy shield right. for UK transfers. And so it's good that this extension is going to be in place, but it will require that extra step for, for everybody to take to make sure that those commitments are extended. No, that's really, that's, that's really helpful. Coben, thank you so much for helping us and helping the audience, our listeners, really get up to speed on where we are in this landscape right now with Data Privacy Framework. I know it's been a lot for people to understand and take in over the last couple of weeks, so hopefully they will find this conversation extremely helpful. So thank you so much for your time today. And I want to thank everyone for listening as well. Again, I'll, I'll mention the resources that we have available to companies. You can go on our website. If you want to get a better understanding of kind of the, the data privacy framework timeline, please do so. Please sign up for our privacy initiatives newsletter. BBB National Programs Data Privacy Framework Services is open for business. So please send us an email if you're interested. Go on our website. Someone will, on my team will get back to you. As always, if you've missed any of our episodes, our previous episodes, please check them out at accountabilitystudios.org, your Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your podcasts. And also, lastly, be sure to leave us a review and let us know what you'd like to hear next on the Privacy Abbreviated. So again, thank you so much, Coben. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great being here and talking about this. Thanks, everybody. Bye.